Awesome to welcome SMU head coach Rob Lanier to the basketball podcast. Lanier has more than 30 years as a collegiate coach, including as an associate head coach or assistant coach at Tennessee, Texas, Florida, Virginia, Rutgers, St. Bonaventure, and seven seasons as a head coach at Siena and Georgia State. He's been part of teams that have made 12 NCAA tournaments and earned 19 total postseason bids. Those teams also have five conference titles, three regular season championships, and two tournament crowns, plus five more trips to a league tournament final. In his three seasons prior to SMU at Georgia State, the team went 53-30, and winning the Sun Belt Tournament in 2022 and advancing to the NCAA tournament. Rob, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Chris. Honored to be here. Well, great to talk to you. And uh, we first connected together because of uh, CoachSpeak.net, uh, which is a great resource for coaches, um, expertise and perspective from coaches as they share it in their own words. So talk to us a little bit about that and where it started and uh, where it is now. Yeah, I would say uh, maybe uh, 2016, I was I was invited to a symposium uh, a, uh, a collection of aspiring head coaches. I was an assistant at the time and aspiring athletic directors, guys who at that particular time were, uh, you know, administrators uh, uh, at various universities. And um, the thrust of the symposium was, well, how do you become, you know, a head coach? What are the steps to take? Who are the people to know? What does the process look like? And how do you position yourself? And one of the things that was highlighted in the meeting, uh, which was held at the offices of a search firm, was uh, they put on a big screen, a database, and they went through every assistant coach in the country and they could click on their name. And from that, they had access to uh, articles uh, that were written about this individual um, interviews that this person had done, whether they be on YouTube or otherwise. And so there was all of this information to be gathered about these individuals, uh, very little of which was coming from them. Mm -hmm. uh, it was stuff that was done about them, except for some of the, in, you know, the interviews probably were Q&A type stuff. But it occurred to me that um, that it might not be a bad idea for coaches to be able to put their competence on display in their own words. And uh, so I, I set out to create that platform. And it's, it's interesting because it was a Sunday morning. And you remember these, I mean, you, you're in Canada, right, Chris? I don't, I don't know. I'm if, in California now, but. Uh, okay. So you, 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 at the time there was a bunch of ads about GoDaddy.com where Danica Patrick was the yeah. pitch person for them. And so I decided that morning I was going to start a website called coachspeak.net. And uh, I did a logo on my own. I since paid some money and got one done professionally. But on that day, uh, I think it was uh, it was June 2017. I uh, I set out to to uh, to create the website. And by midnight of that same night, I had put up the first post. The first post on the site is called Post Up. And that that article is about why I created the site and how I went about it. And and since then, there's been about fifty or so articles written by coaches of varying levels of prominence. But um, you know, Don Staley, Matt Painter, Billy Donovan, people of of prominence. But some great stories, messages, perspectives from guys that are have less notoriety but have a, a, a equally profound message to share. Um, and it's not all about coaching. You know, one in particular, I'll just give you an example. Rodney Terry, who I ran into the other day, Rodney's, uh, you know, was the head coach at Fresno State in UTEP. And now he's back on the staff at University of Texas. He has an article called Listen to Your Body. And he had some medical complications that uh, some of us would get in the grind and get on this, this uh, hamster wheel. And um, we ignore some of the signs that our body might be giving us in the interest of trying to win and compete and do what we've been conditioned to do. And he found himself in some real dire uh, medical circumstances um, and uh, really some life-threatening situation because he didn't listen to his body. He wrote an article about that. And that's something that's is true about life in general, but it's something in particular in our profession that you can neglect your own health 
in the interest of trying to win. And so uh, so that's the thrust of it. And uh, it, it's been a great endeavor and it's created some relationships for me. I mean, you and I are talking about it. It's how we came together and and people have seen it, not knowing that I'm the one behind it. And uh, because I do have a, a, a Twitter page. And so people have contacted me saying, how do I get an article on the page? And, and uh, it, it's been it's been a nice hobby for me. That's great stuff. And uh, I, I can't I cannot support it enough. And I hope coaches go check it out. Coachspeak.net. Uh, the main thing, again, and which I love is you're giving coaches a voice from their own voice. And uh, it, again, it's not that media is always unfair or portrays people wrong, but That's it right. just again, there are those chances that sometimes and I think in general as a coaching profession, we're misrepresented in terms of what the realities of the profession are. So it gives some perspectives that are real and honest, right? Yeah, I, I think that, but also, Chris, just quite frankly, I think basketball coaches, coaches in general are great storytellers. Mm. There's so many unique experiences that you have in our profession, dealing with young people and your love and passion for the game that produces so many experiences that are unique. I'm working on a book myself and the book is a collection of stories and encounters from my coaching journey. Um, and two of the chapters from the book are on the website. And so, uh, I, and I think most coaches could put together something of this sort, because I do think so many experiences that we have trying to get into a profession, particularly in division one basketball, for example, where there's only 365 schools or so. So there's a, there's a finite number of job opportunities that exist head coach, assistant, et cetera. And because of that, to break in, to, to, to sustain a career and have some longevity, it comes with some unbelievable experiences that uh, I, I, I like to have a platform where a lot of those stories could be shared. Well, I don't know if one of the articles is two-step that you share this, uh, this back and forth with uh, Rick Barnes and part of this experience of, uh, you know, getting hired and uh, the different things that go with it. But uh, it's just a great story and, uh, you know, a great real perspective. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate you taking time to, to, to read that. And, and certainly, um, you know, uh, Rick has been uh, pivotal in my journey and career. He's been a great man in my life and, and, uh, I will always uh, be indebted to him for sure. Well, we'll probably bring him up a little bit later, but let's talk. Let's talk a little bit more about you and uh, obviously incredible success at Georgia State. And uh, I'm just curious then with, uh, you know, your resume, which is incredible and the longevity speaks for itself. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's go back to that head first head coaching experience at Siena. How did that experience prepare you for this next head coaching job, which was Georgia State? Yeah, you know, I've said this. I don't know who's going to li listen to your podcast. I know it's pretty popular, but uh, this will be redundant for those who have heard me talk about this before. But, um, you know, when I was a younger coach, um, I did a good job of comporting myself in such a way that uh, I developed a reputation as a young guy who had a bright future. And uh, some a lot of that has to do with the fact that I've been fortunate to be around a, good people that I learned a lot from. And, and I tried to remain humble because I knew that I didn't know very much. And so I, I think a byproduct of that, by the time uh, I had spent two years with uh, Jack Armstrong at Niagara and five years with Jim Barron, who was a phenomenal human being and a tremendous coach, I had learned so much from those two individuals um, but I was still trying to find my footing in terms of, all right, you know, what will it look like if I ever had my own opportunity? You know, I'm still learning the game and learning how to lead. And then I got with Rick Barnes and, and uh, you know, through association and getting to the NCAA tournament a couple of times, that always kind of bolsters your, your profile. And so I got a couple of job interviews way before I was ready, but I did interview well. And so by the time I was 28, 29, I had three head coaching interviews under my belt. And so this idea of me being a, a, a young head coach on the rise was kind of catching some steam. And uh, I wound up interviewing for Siena on a 
Saturday in uh, in New Jersey. And on that ensuing Tuesday, I was doing a press conference. And uh, I wasn't ready for that job. I was like a young player who's got a lot of tools and some talent, but didn't really know how to play yet. You know, that's who I was as a young coach. And, but I stumbled into some stuff. We went to the NCAA tournament our first year. We won 20 plus games and we beat Villanova and we beat Providence and we got to the NIT and won a couple of games and got close, you know, to going to, to play St. John's in New York. And so, um, but uh, I, I, I was, I wasn't ready for the job. Uh, I was more ready for the interview than I was for the job itself. And I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know the the difference between a veteran team and a young team or a big team and a small team and, and uh, all the different things that you have to deal with as a coach and you have to adapt to in order to win with the group you have. Um, I just figured, you know, I knew everything. It was my way and, they listened to me. They were going to be successful. And uh, and I didn't really know a whole lot about leadership and bringing people together in such a way that uh, that when I when I left Siena and uh, I spent two years at Virginia with Dave Leto, which was a great experience for me. And then I spent four years with Billy Donovan. And by that time, I really started to, to the the time at Siena started. It started to pay some dividends then. Like I started to develop some clarity uh, once I was with with Billy um, and I started to understand some of the things I was on the right track with. And I started to see some of the things that I was missing as a leader. And uh, and I got to walk in his office and see it every day, like what makes him great. Um, the, the kind of uh, culture that he creates with the people there, the level of commitment and uh everything about him, you know, uh, really highlighted for me with, with a clear picture of like, okay, uh, I, I can see this thing a little bit better now. And then um, another story from the website is those five days that I, when I, after I got the job at Florida, he had taken the Orlando magic job and changed his mind. And I, I wrote a story about, about that. And, and because of that experience, there was the, the real possibility that before too long, Billy was going to leave for the NBA. So I went back to Texas to be with Rick and it was more uh, growth on my part. Now I've gone with Billy and I've really started to develop a clearer picture. And then I, I started to develop an even clearer picture and appreciation for Rick Barnes. And I started to see him through a different light, having gone through that experience at Siena. And, and with both of those guys saying, man, this dude been doing this 30 years. How is he doing this? You know? And uh, and gradually, I just, I, it became more and more clear that it's really about the people and the way I feel about coach and feel about Billy Donovan and having worked for them is more important than a stagger screen or how we're playing ball screens and all of the genius that they have as it relates to the game, um, there is even greater genius in the way that they galvanize people. And um, and I, I miss that. You know, I wanted to be a star and um, and I, I missed on what it was really about to be a leader. And, and fortunately, uh, after eight more years with Coach Barnes, I got a phone call and an opportunity to go to Georgia State one that I didn't anticipate, one that I was not trying to uh, position myself for in any way. It happened completely organically. And uh, and as a result, um, it turned out to be a good situation for me and my family. And uh, and here we are in Dallas now. <laughs> That's great. It's uh, It's been fun to watch. And your team was excellent to watch, I mean, through your years at Georgia State. But, you know, especially what stood out last year is uh, basically when you look at the numbers yeah, and your run to the NCAA tournament last year, it was so interesting that you started the season seemingly with one identity and you finished it with another one in the sense that, you know, you really turned that team into one of the best defensive teams in the country. And, uh, you know, that didn't appear to be kind of how you started it out, did you? <laughs> I tell you what, I give you a lot of credit, Chris. I mean, you're really astute and, um, you know, you do these Zooms and not everybody does their homework the way you have. I mean, that's a great because, I mean, you're, you're, you're in our 
coaches meetings right now in <laughs> in December. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying is, and, and you, you know, as a coach, um, you know, we went into uh, last season, pick number one in the, in the Sun Belt. And uh, we had uh, all five starters returning, top seven guys returning. Um, and then in the off season, we we had a um, a group of kids who uh, were were very adamant about not getting vaccinated, and there was nothing I could do about that. And I was fine with it. You know, my wife's a physician; she convinced me to do it. But if it weren't for her, I would have been in the same position they were in. I was skeptical and had more questions than answers. So I wasn't going to impose on them just because I wanted to win that they had to um, get the vaccine. What I did ask of them that if you don't get it and whatever complications we have as a team, as a result of that, that we go through that together. Hmm. I won't blame you. You don't blame me. And we're going to go through some ups and downs because people are going to miss games. We're going to miss practices. We had just went through it the year before, but as long as we go through it together and you guys, you can stick to your guns and we'll figure it out. And sure enough, we got to December and we had our share of struggles and um, they kept their word. We kept ours. And uh, we made it clear that we had to, you know, we weren't shooting the ball well and we were scoring 80 points a game the previous two years. We were top 20 in scoring, top 20 in pace our first year. And we were good defensively, but we weren't scoring. We didn't have the rhythm. We didn't have that continuity to play the game that we had kind of become known for inside our league and that we were going to have to shift our focus and we we're going to have to be tougher and we're going to have to be more disciplined and we're not going to win in the eighties. Uh, we're going to have to fight now. And uh, to our guys credit and to our coaches credit, that became our focus and we got out of it what we put into it, but to do that in season is rare. We all knew that, but, we did have a goal in mind and and uh, we were going to have to do something different to get it. And uh, they bought into that. Well, it speaks to your maturity as a, as a coach as well. And maybe that's something you might not have been able to do at Siena when you're a younger coach, right? To be able to mid season adapt and adjust. And that just, that it requires humility and it obviously requires a lot of work and uh, a lot of buy-in from your players. I mean, full credit. I mean, Chris Creator, who I know a little bit, one of your coaches and of your great staff, uh, shared some of these insights with me and just in terms of uh, helping me understand kind of how you guys did things over the years and just incredible stuff. Oh, thanks. You know, I, and I am blessed to have a great staff. Chris is, uh, Chris is one of the very best in the business, one of the hardest working guys I've ever been around. I've been fortunate and blessed to be around some great coaches. And and one of the things I've learned going back to, you know, the, the, the question about Sienna is like, I didn't have an appreciation for how important all of these people are. Um, I thought their role was to serve me instead of the other way around. And that's what I was witnessing between Billy and Rick Barnes is that um, they take their passion for the game and they channel it through service to others. Um, and then obviously there's a competitive spirit that, that uh, ties it all together. Um, but uh, and so I, I learned a lot about how important it is to surround yourself with really good people and then uh, allow them to do what makes them good. And uh, uh, luckily, I figured some of that stuff out. Well, no doubt you'd surround yourself with great people. Um, and your adaptability, once again, will be on display, no doubt, as you transition to SMU. And, uh, you know, is it challenging, you know, to go to a new program? You've done it enough, obviously, in your time, you know, as an assistant and as a head coach, transitioning to different head coaching jobs. But uh, knowing you have a formula for success from Georgia State, is is it hard to move outside of that if you need to, to be able to adapt to your new surroundings with SMU? I think so. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it's hard. Um, it's just a part of it. You know, it's what you have to uh, be willing to do. Um, every situation is unique. Sometimes it's a cleaner transition than others, depending on where you're coming from and where you're going. But 
Um, I think one of the things that 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 has helped is that we have had a mode of operation because we've got some continuity staff wise, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that it ain't the same job and it doesn't require the same skill set. There's some other things that we're going to have to apply to this job that simply does not apply to Georgia State's situation. And we are aware of that. That's not lost on what, us. What might be some of those things, players. Coach? Just as an example, what would be one of those things? Well, uh, it's funny. I, w- I was saying this to um, to uh, Kyle when we were making the move. Kyle is always thinking outside of the box. And when I was coming up in the profession, I cut my teeth at St. Bonaventure. You're an hour and a half away from the nearest airport. Um, you're in what is considered the snow belt. Um, it's a small town of 16,000 people that isn't very diverse. So you have to find creative ways to work around some of those things to get good players so that you can be competitive in the Atlantic 10. Then when you go to Rutgers, you don't have those same challenges. Your challenges are different and you have to figure those out and adapt. And so it, it very much the same thing. Um, you know, we were dealing with a different budget, different travel, uh, everything as it relates to taking care of your players with regard to meals and all of these other things. Um, it's just a different ball game and you can get caught up in the weeds of what you were doing at Georgia state. And they've already got people that do that stuff. That stuff is in place. So you got some other fish to fry when you're at a place like this and there's different relationships to create and different connections with alumni and people that are really invested in this program. And so you just have to make sure that you're not wasting time on things that are already in place because you're stuck in the day-to-day operations that took place at Georgia State. It's a great place, but it's 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 a different setup. It's a different kind of campus. It's a different dynamic as in terms of its relationship to this particular community. And so, and then from a basketball landscape, it's a different recruiting animal. So there's so many different things that you have to adapt to. And then quite frankly, it's a higher level of basketball. So uh, we can't just have the mindset. We just keep doing what we've been doing and it's just going to translate. You know, we know that uh, it's a unique uh, challenge and we, everyone's got to step it up a notch. You know, in talking to coaches, it could be something as simple as, uh, you know, something you ran or a drill you used at a past school with different players just didn't work the same at the next school with different players. And is is it sometimes as simple as that, that some things just don't translate because it's a different group of players? Absolutely. You know, we we, we ran a, a ball screen heavy uh, system at Georgia State. We played fast, but we we had three guards that could play pretty well in pick and rolls. And we had bigs who weren't back to the basket, post up, low post guys. So we had to keep them moving, but we didn't have that that traditional stretch for that people were playing with. So we we tapped into a way to play a 6'10 and a 6'9 together without the four out spacing that is so common with everyone today. And a lot of times it's five out. Well, all right, how are we going to play with three playmaking guards and two bigs that don't stretch the floor? Um, And so we found something that worked for us, and we got pretty good at it. And we found even this summer, this team is not suited for that. You know, we can run that as a play or as a concept, but as our base offense, as the thing that we really teach day in and day out, we have to think outside of, what we did the last three years and really hone in on what we have and how we can best utilize them. Yeah, it's going to be fun to watch and to see how you guys do things. And uh, from, from a professional perspective, so, you know, you, your family, you personally, you know, you've been in a lot of different schools. Is, is there much, much different from a professional perspective for you and your family to be able to go to different places? Well, yeah. And you know what happens too, Chris, it, it's happened. You know, I got young kids. My, well, well, they're not young now. My son is on the team here. He transferred to us from Davidson. My daughter is a sophomore. She transferred here from UNC Charlotte. So we got the whole band back together. 
so much of the moves that we made over the years um, took place at varying stages of their growth. You know, we we moved when they were in elementary school. We moved when they were in middle school. Then we made one really hard move when they were in high school. And then we made this move while they were in college. And so they become really adaptable, but we had to go through some real turbulence to get to this point because you pull kids away from their friends and the things that they're used to and they enjoy and the cities that they, you know, fell in love with and the school that they like and their teachers that they like, all of those things, the comfort. Um, it, uh, it took some time and now they're very adaptable and, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I I hated was I always wanted for them to have what, you know, I think maybe you and I have is I have a hometown. Mm, you yeah. know? And, and my kids are almost like military kids and people ask them where they're from. It's like a trick question because, you know, my son was born in Austin. But uh, but after a month, you know, he was already moved to Albany, New York. And since then, he's been Albany, Charlottesville. Gainesville, uh, back to Austin, Knoxville, Atlanta, and now Dallas. And so it's become a part of our, you know, uh, reality as a family. Do you have and, any uh, advice for people that would go through these with handling that for your kids or for your, uh, your yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah, find a, find a wife that is invested in you and your career. And, um, and I've been fortunate that uh, my wife is a real trooper, and um, it's about it's about the four of us, you know. One of the articles that I that I'm one of the chapters I'm working on for my book is an article called "A Thousand Words." It's a picture. There's a picture from my press conference here of my family sitting in the front row, looking up at me, smiling. And, and the reason why I, the, the chapter is called A Thousand Words, because I when I see that picture, I think about the day that I got fired and I walked in my home that afternoon and it was those three. And for my wife and I, you know, we want to help as many people as we can. And we've got family and people and relationships that we built over the years and we're going to try to be a blessing to as many people as possible but it's about the four of us the decisions we make the things that we do is 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 about our family and so the biggest key for any young coach that's aspiring is is to make sure you do a great job communicating if you've got um, if you're in a young relationship and you're building a relationship and this is a part of it what I tried to do is because I knew that my wife and I had a great relationship is I really tried to educate her on the realities of our profession. And uh, so that she wouldn't be surprised by all of this. And she's been all in the whole time and, and she makes everything work, you know, the communication with the kids through all those tough times. And, and uh, she's really in a lot of times when, when you're in the midst of this, sometimes she's raising them almost by herself at times even though I'm there and I care about them and I love them, but sometimes you're detached because you're so focused on what you're doing and you need someone that supports that. And, and I've been blessed in that way for sure. I have no doubt about that. And uh, connecting a little bit back to your program, then uh, I've been told you have three core values in your program that shape the way you guys approach things. Would you, would you share those with us? Yeah. Um, humility, respect, and responsibility. And uh, what we do to start each year, and we talk about it all the time, and eventually these guys will internalize it. You know, we're new. I, I think in our previous program, um, it became something that was really ingrained in what we've done. And, and uh, I personally, you know, we give them the, defini the, the dictionary definition of each of those words, and we, ex we expand on it. We put it on the walls, and we really mean it. And... Uh, I wrote this down. Uh, I was flying from Knoxville to Las Vegas one year, and and I was really thinking of like, all right, what what would my program really be about? And those were the th three things that came up. And the humility piece is is the the, the most critical because I think for young people, um, you get a small window of opportunity to capitalize on the talent you've been blessed with, 
and you get to be on a college campus uh, by virtue of that. And what do you do with that time? And I think in general, young people who think they have all the answers, who already think they're a finished product, um, they deny themselves the opportunity to truly improve and become the best version of themselves. And so this whole uh, college basketball experience is really fleeting. You and I know that if, if you have someone for four years now, that's brief let alone the way the, the landscape is now. But with the time you have, are you going to make the most of it? And the more humility you have in your character, the more time you're going to spend in the gym, uh, the more uh, uh, grateful you're going to be about the opportunity to get an, uh, an education, and the better the relationships you're going to cultivate during that time that will serve you beyond your time on a college campus. And so... Um, we, we talk about being humble all of the time. And uh, and it really, for me, drove the way I assembled my staff. I was looking for people like this, um, people who want to grow and get better and want to have great experiences and want to serve young people. And without that, you're not going to have the appropriate level of respect that you have to have for the people that you work for, the people you work with, the community that you serve, your teammates, your coaches, et cetera. There's a level of respect that you have for people, time, the law, women. All of these things stem from a starting point of humility. And then the responsibility piece is twofold because we want people to take responsibility, not only for the task that they have to do. Those are part of your responsibilities, but also the accountability piece for your actions. And uh, so to be a person who can be held accountable uh, by themselves and has the humility to be held accountable by whoever they work with or work for, but also to go out in the world and be able to take care of your business as a young person and to be responsible um, you're going to have to pay your own bills one day. You're going to have to hopefully raise your own family one day. And so the, the level of responsibility that comes with being a grown up um, is what we want young people to walk out of what our program with, or at least at some point be able to reflect on this experience in a way that will serve them when they become uh, old people like you and I. <laughs> yeah, it's great stuff. And, uh, you know, you, you, this is your first year at SMU. So can you give us a little bit of perspective on you get the job? How do you start bringing those core values to life in the first few weeks that you're now the head coach at SMU? Well, um, the first part was to be able to bring most of my staff with me because mm -hmm. they already um, represent it. They do. And, you know, when you're trying to engage with a new group of young people, um, there's your words, but you also need them to be fortified with the people that that you're aligned with. And if you're coming in and you're constructing an entirely new staff, then you have to educate that staff for it to filter down to the players. But if that staff is already in place, then uh, those messages flow uh, more seamlessly and naturally to the players that uh, that we are what we say we are. We are going to do the things that we talk about and that uh, we're we're about the players first. And so I think that the thing is, is that when you do get to a new place, that your attention turns to them and they become your focus and where they're at emotionally in the midst of a coaching change, which is a traumatic thing for a lot of young people, all of the unknown and uncertainty that it comes with that, that they need to get to know you and they want to. And so you have to, and so if your staff is already in place, you can engage in that process in a much different way. Um, and then obviously uh, when you go out to recruit, because you generally have to hit the ground running and do that. And we had to bring in, we brought in eight new guys. So uh, that was critical. Um, and having a staff in place helps you evaluate what the kind of things that you want in young people and in players. And so um, the staff piece was critical to that. The focus on, on, on our players is critical. 
Um, and there was a fit here to begin with. And that's why it was something I was excited about because there's good people here in our administration that, uh, that I felt a certain level of alignment with that had I not experienced, I wouldn't have taken the job because I had that at Georgia State and I wouldn't have left that for something that didn't have that same sense of alignment. And uh, you know, you talk about those those players. Obviously, uh, are are your is your first contact and sharing these core values? Is that through you know text, through phone call, through uh, you know personal meetings, through team meetings? What are some of the mechanisms that you're sharing these values? Yeah, face to face. Yeah, you know, uh, my first opportunity to meet with those guys to let them know that I sat in their chair, that uh, I signed with one coach as a senior, played for another coach when I got to campus and then I played for another coach as a senior. Mm. So right off the top, I was able to explain to them that, uh, you know, I say this all the time because, you know, every year there's all these coaching changes and all this speculation about who's going to get what job and such. And, uh, you know, in that communication, you know, there's very little talk about how that affects the players. And so I wanted for them to know that, um, you know, we do have a way of doing things, which will probably be different. It's just because we're different, not because we're better. And, but because we're different, there are going to be guys who are going to buy into that and guys who aren't. And the guys who do buy into it, then you're one of us, regardless of how you got here. And the guys who don't buy into it, then quite frankly, then, then you know, you want to uh, cordially communicate with those people in a way that uh, allows them to pursue opportunities that will fit them better. And uh, and I, I think in this landscape, you have to be open-minded and uh, and allow people the freedom to make those decisions on their own. And uh, we allow those guys the freedom to do that. Some decided to go, some decided to stay, and, and, uh, and we're building those relationships as we speak, and we feel good about it. Uh, we're looking forward to watching. And, uh, you know, obviously 30 years in the business and uh, many different roles with many different people. Uh, curious then, uh, we always ask about advice to younger coaches, and I, I do want that at some point here. But maybe let's start with advice to older coaches, because I don't think we consider that as much nowadays that, uh, you know, someone like yourself has some advice to us older coaches. Well, it's funny. Uh, I, I was I was having a conversation about this very thing recently. It wasn't in the context of coaches. I was speaking at a local event here with some guys my age, some older, some maybe a little bit younger. And we were talking about young people these days. <laughs> and, and it was a Q&A. I was speaking, and so it was a Q&A. And, and, and the gentleman who was asking the question framed the question in a way that was talking about how different young people are. And my challenge to him or my retort was that I don't think young people are any different than we were at all. What I think is that they, they live in a world that they didn't create that is much different than the world we grew up in. So by virtue of that, there might be some undesirable behaviors that young people exhibit, but it's not because at their core, that they're wired differently than we were at 12 or 13 or 14 or 15. Because had we, the, the, the same Chris Oliver, if you were dealing with social media and all of that stuff at 10, 11, 12, 13, you probably develop some of the same sensitivities and misgivings that young people today exhibit. Agreed. So the question is not whether or not they're different. They're not. But because they live in a different world, how do you reach them? Mm. And so the challenge for older coaches is to find out where they are. This is a great thing that I always say to people about Billy Donovan. Every time when we would meet, he would always go, where are the guys at? Where are they at? You know, that's my little Billy Donovan impression. But he would be saying, where are they at? And at first, I'm like, what do you mean where are they at? They're in class right now. What are you talking about? But – he was constantly, as we went through the season, as we went through the practice season, the, 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 the non-conference, the conference, he was constantly like, where are they at so that we can meet them there and move them to where we need them to go? Mm -hmm. But if we're not in touch with where they are, 
then we're not going to reach them. And then we'll, then we're going to blame it on them. And so uh, that would be my, my advice to older coaches is to detach yourself from how you were and don't coach a kid while comparing them to how you were. Coach him based on where he's at, based on who he is, and get to know him well enough. Find out where he is. And if you don't believe in him enough that he's worth that time, then then, then you got to do a better job recruiting. Um, but by and large, I think young people are wired the same way we were. They're young people who want to make, make it in life, whatever that means to them. They want to be successful. And they're trying to figure out the world, but they've got so much more clutter to get to that. And whatever time you have with them, you have an opportunity to clear some of that debris for them so that they can see things more clearly. And that's why I need a humble staff. That's why I got to surround myself with people so that we can we can try to help them navigate these things. Yeah, that's some incredible advice. Thanks, coach. And then what would you say to younger coaches then? Uh, reputation is the most important thing that you have in our profession is to create a good reputation based on how hard you work, how you treat people, and your talent, whatever it is, your ability to communicate and try to get good in those three areas. Work really hard, try to develop as a communicator and treat people with love and respect. And in doing so, you will create a reputation on whether it's at a high school, college campus, whatever level you're at, if you're a GA, if you're a manager, um, do things in such a way that people will say good things about you. Not because you want people to say good things about you, but do the right things because they're right. And it, keep that passion that you have to grow on display through your work ethic. And, uh, you know, all of that is wrapped in humility. But I, I really believe that uh, if you can develop a great reputation, then you have to work hard to nurture that. And then ultimately you have to protect it. And I, I just think reputation is everything. Like I was saying earlier, there's such a finite number of job opportunities in our profession that having a poor reputation as it relates to either your work ethic or your ability to work with other people is going to undermine any career aspirations you might have when it comes to uh, getting a job. So um, I think reputation is vital. Uh, and so um, any young coach should uh, lock in on trying to make sure you do right by people. Awesome advice throughout this podcast, Coach. And, uh, you know, you've been at some big-time places and had big-time success. And uh, now at SMU, what do you see here that's going to help you uh, make that the big time? You know, I, I spent six years here in Texas. I watched this place a little bit from afar. You know, uh, Coach Brown was here doing some dynamite things. Coach Jankovic had him playing at a really high level. Um, and I was always intrigued, you know, uh, when I would watch these games on TV in Moody Coliseum, it seemed like there was a different energy than the other schools in the state of Texas as it related to basketball. It really reminded me of the Northeast. Uh, 7,000 seat arena packed. It really made me feel like the old Big East, that energy Atlantic 10 Big East. When, when, I, would, when I would tune in on TV, it just felt different. I, I've been at a lot of college towns, Charlottesville, Gainesville, Knoxville, and there's a different kind of passion when you get into the South and you've got the, these uh, huge athletic programs. And I feel like we have a combination of that sort of passion around basketball coupled with the city of Dallas, which is one of the top four markets in the country. It's a unique combination with a city that's got the – the most popular NFL franchise, um, a, a, a big time NBA franchise, an NHL franchise, and one division one college athletic program and a passion on the campus 
for basketball that reminds me of the Northeast or a small town, a college type town in the center of the city of Dallas. I just think it's a unique combination. And then you're talking about one of the truly elite academic institutions in all the country. It's a lot of boxes to check there. And there's a lot of reasons to believe that we can be successful. And uh, it, uh, it it really has energized us as a staff and me in particular. I feel like there is a real opportunity to do something special here. Well, we're so excited to watch it, Coach. And uh, we can't thank you enough for uh, sharing the game with us here on the podcast. Well, I appreciate everything you do, Chris. Thank you.